What's up guys, Axis here, back with part 3 of my 3 part um, Octane Cinema 4D tutorial on soft lighting. And today is the final part which we are going to be doing the uh, lighting and HDR and stuff like that. So it shouldn't be too long of a tutorial, um, but obviously you'd want to spend a lot of time uh, trying to get it right. So I'm just going to open up the live viewer. If you haven't seen the uh, the parts prior to this, then I'll have a link uh, in the top right for a card annotation, which will take you to part two or part one, probably part one, so you can restart it. Um, but yeah, in those we covered the modeling and the texturing. So now for the lighting. First off, I'm just going to grab a HDRI, uh, go inside the image texture and find your HDRI that you're wanting to use. I'm going to click no for that and then if we go ahead and send this to our scene should then update with the HDRI. I'll show you without the HDRI. That's it without and then with the HDRI. Lots of reflections, looks really nice. Um, I think one of the textures has actually just lost itself here. Uh, let's see. Looks Right, there we go, we've got the texture back. So as you can see, all the reflections on there look really nice. Even without the texture, it looks really cool. So, obviously, personal preference. So there we go, we got that in. And then also I'm going to bring in a camera, uh, which will be Octane Camera and Objects. Click here to make it the active camera, go into Thin Lens. And basically, um, this works like a normal camera. So if you have it used the camera at all, like with a, like a decent camera with a decent lens, stuff like that, you would have come across some of these settings. So basically reducing the f-stop will increase the aperture, uh, which long story short is going to create depth of field. So it's not so obvious if I'm not zoomed in, but for example, I'll move up here. As you can see up there, it's blurred out. And the further you increase or decrease, it uh, will increase the aperture. It's going to decrease the f-stop and increase the blur amount. Um, autofocus, I'd recommend that for uh, for stills or even motion as well, but um, if it gets in front of any other object then it will blur out, so I'll show you an example of that. If I get a, a cube, just a random object, it's going to blur this out. It's going to blur the background out, which may be what you want. It's not what I want, so here we go. I'm just going to center this camera again. Out of it. So yeah, um, I may want to turn this up to like 20, might look nice. Um, and if you want to choose the focus, what you can do is you can uh, uncheck autofocus and uh, you can you can either find the, uh, f the right focal distance by actually controlling this, but uh, you can easily do this by doing control and then middle click and choosing a focus. So I could choose a background, make it out of focus, so I could choose that sphere and it will make the whole object in focus. So just in case you wanted to focus on another part or if the uh, or if you didn't have like a sphere in the middle then obviously it's going to blur out and you're not going to see the uh, the actual object that you want. So yeah, hopefully that helps. And then uh, for post-processing I'm going to want to turn up the uh, bloom power slightly. Uh, not too much because you can easily do this in post-production and you obviously don't want to make it um, like you don't want to turn up too far otherwise you're not going to be able to edit it later because um, you know you can obviously add more bloom uh, after the fact but you can't reduce bloom that easily uh, glare power kind of creates like a lens flare effect which you might want I mean maybe a bit of it would look nice like that and I might also want to go ahead and change the, the kind of position of the HDRI just to create a better shadow. You can also artifici uh, artificially do this by creating a light in the scene, which I'll do in a second. Uh, but if I zoom out a bit, I'll be able to see the shadow. I'm going to put this back to auto focus, and I'm going to go into the the uh, settings. I'm going to change this to path tracing, which I really like. Um, path tracing is normally what people use for final renders. Um, but in some cases, 
you may want to use direct lighting for interior scenes um, or even motion because the uh, render times tend to be faster so I'm going to do a kind of standard sample rate which is uh, 2048 I'm going to go 10 and 10 on the uh, diffuse and specular you really don't need uh, depth that high unless you're using like uh, I guess SSS something like that then you might want to uh, turn up the specular depth but 10 and 10 should be absolutely fine even lower if you're doing a motion scene so yeah uh, I'll come back and edit that soon and then we're gonna add a light I'll show you how lights work briefly you go into objects and octane area light as you can see we've already got one in the scene I'm gonna go to details this is just part of the normal uh, cinema 4d light I'm gonna change this to sphere uh, and then I'm going to go to the tag and I'm going to go to visibility, uncheck it and then you won't be able to see it in the scene so that's much better um, you will be able to see it in reflections though, keep that in mind you, so you might want to make the roughness of a material slightly higher if you can see it in reflections but in this case it's fine because the bump deals with that uh, then in light settings this works very similar to the uh, emission, the black body emission that uh, we looked at in the tutorial prior to this. Um, so basically everything's the same. Color, uh, kind of temperature, you can control the color as well. And then if you click this you can get an RGB spectrum in here and change the color. So I'm not going to do that. And by default it's set to surface brightness which is what I recommend. I might also want to turn down the, uh, the bloom because we've got a light in here now and I might make the light like uh, I'll just leave it neutral and from here we can kind of artificially control the shadow on this object and you got some harsh harsh little accents here so you can kind of diffuse that a bit by uh, turning up the bloom power um, like that also we're going to want to turn up the sample rate I'm going to go for 10k so that's looking all right um yeah i don't really know what else i want to do with this apart from changing the camera imager click on here and then click off for the response and then we can scroll through all these see which one you actually like uh, i'll come back to that one Some of these are really harsh. I don't like going with the really harsh ones because you could do that in post-production. I don't know. Kind of like that one, but it looks too overpowering. I might just go back to that one I did a couple of minutes ago. What was it? Probably shouldn't care that much, but want it to look good. Now well, let's just go with that. So as you can see, there's lots of possibilities. You can spend ages working on this uh, and just playing with parameters. But that's pretty much it. Um, I don't really have anything else for the uh, lighting. The only other things could be the uh, the output. Uh, now as you can see I've got a 4, uh, 4k output here but what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this onto Octane Renderer which will mean when you export this it's going to use Octane's uh, renderer instead of Cinema 4D's and I'm going to change the uh, the buffer type to uh, Tone Mapped if it's not on Tone Mapped you don't want 8-bit because the colours are quite limited on 8-bit uh, I'm going to go 16 if you want to use 32-bit use uh, TIFF but I'm going to be just using PNG, which works fine. I don't really notice a difference. Uh, TIFF is a really uncompressed and it, uh, file size, and also you can uh, it will export PSD layers if you use, uh, I believe it's, I forgot what it's called. It starts with an M. It's not one of these. It's like in the options. Oh, multipass. There we go. If you create lots of multipass filters and you can export them with layers and stuff like that and PSDs, um, which is nice, but I don't really need that, so I'm going to go with PNG, obviously save it here, and if you have an alpha layer, check that. 
Uh, for the final output, I like to go to the settings and uh, if it's a if it's a still, then I'll turn it up to like 10k. Or if it's a, a normal image, I'll maybe do like 2048. Or uh, a lot of the time, I'll go and do 1250. Uh, that's if your renders are really struggling. But normally, uh, 2048 will be fine for motion. So I'll just leave that on 2048 at the moment. And then, uh, all these other settings, uh, I'll run through them briefly. GL clamp will reduce the render time if you bring it down, but bring it down too far and shadows will just completely like submerge your, <laughs> your photo. So some like 200 will be fine for most scenes. Uh, and the only other thing that will really speed up render time is the coherent ratio which works really well for stills, but if you bump this up during uh, motion, then you're gonna get a lot of flickering between frames, which might not be too good, but the render time increase is quite immense. So if we look at two minutes right now on this, if I go 0.3, you're gonna see this drop by a couple, maybe like 20 or 30 uh, seconds, which may be worth it. I normally go with 0.1, works fine, I think. But when I'm just uh, in the preview, I normally just go zero because you get some weird flickering when you move about the scene. So yeah, that basically wraps up everything that I wanted to talk about. Uh, and once you've exported this, you can go and do all your color correcting and all that good stuff. But other than that, thanks for watching. Leave a comment with your feedback and leave a like if you enjoyed.